So, einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier in der Heinrich-Böll-Stiftung. Schön, dass Sie alle hier hergekommen sind. Zu Good evening, I'm very happy to welcome Vorfeld. you. This is an event ja, was kommt auf die in anticipation of the U.S. election. What lies ahead for the economy? That's the question we are pondering tonight, um, this in view of the elections which were upcoming and which will happen real soon. I'm Jan Philipp Albrecht. I'm one of the two chairpersons of the foundation, and I'm happy to welcome you tonight. About two weeks to go until the elections will be held, and now we have to talk about the question, what does this mean for the second biggest national economy in the world, economy in the world, and for Europe and for Germany? All in all, we don't know what the result of this election, the outcome will be, but we all know that the overall debate is a rather passionate one between two personalities who have realistic chances of becoming the future president of the United States. And it's also a debate or dispute even, no matter what result it will trigger for Congress and the Senate, with an impact on the offers we get from the United States. And of course, there are major questions which will certainly have to be raised also with respect to the relations between the United States and Europe and the EU and the economic impact. And that's what we will talk about tonight. What will be the outcome with respect to the economy for the people in the United States and here? I traveled a bit in the United States. I've been there this year, and I tried to get an idea of what is going on. The country has changed quite a bit. When in the past I traveled to the U.S., people always realized that this is a country very much geared to free trade. We also talked about trade agreements in the past, but free trade was one of the pillars of international U.S. policy. But today, when talking about economy, the economy, you might ask the question, where has it gone? The country is very much focused at itself. It's no longer focusing on international trade, on free trade, on international policy, in spite of the fact that Joe Biden's presidency really tried to also focus on the outside again after the first Trump legislature, and yet the country has changed. On the other hand, we see a country where, and this is a bit of a surprise, trade unions and environmental groups and progressive politicians have developed the IRA, one of the biggest economic programs ever, and they have suggested rules, and we've never thought that these rules could be applied in the U.S. And this is a program meant to bring the United States forward and to bring about change where change is needed. So there are a number of questions we will talk about tonight. We will ponder these questions from different perspectives, from a scientific, political, and economic perspective. And of course, we would like to also get you involved. You can ask questions and you use, please, menti.com. And that's the QR code you will need for it. We can also, I mean, you can scan the QR code or you can use the one which is written here. And we do have allowed for a bit of time for questions and answers at the end of our panel discussion. And of course, if you like questions asked by somebody else, you might give it a thumbs up so that the relevance is enhanced. And we will show you this code later. And if you don't 
have your smartphone with you. You can use a slip of paper. We do have a bit of paper here, and you can write your question down, and we will also consider these questions. And, of course, we'd be very happy if you'd join us for some pretzels and drinks afterwards in order to talk about the questions which have remained open. So we will walk down the sheep's staircase, as it's called, and downstairs you will find the hall where we will meet after this event. So much in terms of an introduction, and now I'm happy to introduce the guests of the night. And I'm very happy to welcome them on stage. Simone Menne is an entrepreneur, art lover, supervisory board member, and curator. And since summer 2021, she's been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce in Germany. And this makes her head of the largest German-American business association from 2012 to 2016. Simone Menne was CFO of Lufthansa, the first woman to hold such a position at a DAX-listed company. And she's looking at the election from the perspective of both a manager and a transatlanticist, and that's what we consider exciting. So we are delighted to have you here. Simone, a very warm welcome to you. And we are happy to welcome Rüdiger Bachmann, professor of economics at the University of Notre Dame in the U.S. state of Indiana. He's been there since 2014 and was appointed as a full professor in 2020. And prior to this, he was a professor at the universities of Frankfurt, Aachen, and Michigan. His main focus is macroeconomics, and he has become a recognized and highly sought after expert on economic policy issues beyond academic circles and across the Atlantic, and was a member of several expert groups for German ministries. We're looking forward to your insights, Mr. Bachmann. A very warm welcome to you. Dann eben direkt vom Business hier in den Raum gekommen. And then jumping in from business, Andreas Outrich, a member of the Bundestag and deputy parliamentary leader of the Green Parliamentary Group, he coordinates the Department of Economics, Labour, Social Affairs, Finance and Budget for the Greens in Parliament and is a member of the Committee on Labour and Social Affairs at the Budget Committee. Before joining the Bundestag, he was a member of the Green Party's Berlin Executive from 2016 to 2021. We are very pleased to have you here tonight. Und schließlich. And finally, last but not least, and with her, we want to start this conversation. I would like to welcome Heike Buchter, live from New York. I saw her on the screen before. We'll certainly see her in a minute. She's an economic and financial journalist and has been living and working in New York for more than 20 years. Since 2008, she's been the correspondent for Die Zeit. She's written several books, including books about the American financial system and economic inequality. Hello, Ms. Buchter. Wir können Sie hören. Herzlich willkommen. We can hear you and a very warm welcome, Ms. Buchter, in Germany. Election campaigns in the U.S seem to be very personalized. And since Trump, the stylization of this duel has become more and more extreme. You talk to politicians as well as to people on the streets. What do people consider to be the deciding factors in this election? What issues are the Americans concerned about? Personality cult, I'd even call it, actually. And that's certainly the right label and people tend to forget forget however what really matters for the people there are lots of fans especially in Trump's camp and the media tend to focus on the loudest voices anyway but I'm also traveling all over the country and I try to talk to as many people as possible and the topic most people are interested in are is the economy it's getting more and more difficult to have just a normal salary and feed your family and, and still have a little bit left in old age. 
Qualitäten unterzugehen. Und ich glaube, das ist ähm, I think das, was wir auch erkennen an dieser ganzen... This is what we also see in the anger we see and which is being covered so much by the media. The anger and rage. But also concerning those who are not as angry or are not as often seen in the media, we have to see and they also suffer. It's a slow burner maybe, but they suffer too. Well, indeed, that's a contradiction in Biden's term. The U.S. economy was very successful. Europe looks enviously at the growth rates and the labor market. You've been traveling a lot in the U.S. So what about this positive economic development? Do people see it at all? Well, not all of them. There are those who see a lot also because of the tax gifts Trump made. So the better off certainly do see an advantage or better times. But the others don't, especially since the costs have risen. People talk about inflation quite a lot. And yes, I do realize that there is a lot of inflation. I do see seven dollars, which I have to pay for a small cauliflower in the supermarket. And of course, I ask myself, what do people do who have less money in view of the prices which have risen steeply. So the cost of living have increased considerably. And then it's often underestimated to, uh, sorry, often underestimated are the costs for your rent or if you own a house for property. These costs have increased too considerably. And last week or the week before, no, it was last week, Anyway, I was in Phoenix, Arizona, and I talked to lots of people. And Phoenix is actually a boom town. You have the chip manufacturers, the Taiwanese, Intel. They are all building and producing, and the economy is booming. And this is one of the federal states in the US where the Biden boom can be seen. And yet, people there are somewhat angry or depressed because there is a shortage of housing. Like if you want to have a two-room apartment for your family, you need to earn about $30 per hour. That's the minimum. Sorry, the minimum wage, which is what many people earn there, is $14.35. So you have to have two minimum jobs in order to have a chance to get a roof over your head, uh, provided you find an apartment. And actually, you don't find it. And that's why you have a lot of homelessness, not only in Phoenix, but also in other cities in the country. And all this means that people are not only having difficulties in having ends meet, but they are falling down. Well, at the end, let me ask you a question that we have already uh, received from our guests. What is the misconception about the U.S. election and the U.S. economy that you would like to sort of uh, correct? What should we know in order to better understand the situ situation in the U.S.? What is the discussion that uh, you hear, and how does it resonates in society. Would we all always overestimate is how important it is to the people. We are so much focused just on the election. And of course, there are many people I talk to uh, said, we are tired of being told, don't vote for Trump. We need to save democracy. People are just sick and tired of not being seen in terms of what their problems are, their everyday life problems. Childcare is extremely expensive, and without childcare, you cannot go to work. All of these things tend to be mentioned sometimes, but uh, only 
incidentally, uh, we focus so much on is going uh, is Trump going to abolish democracy? You have to make sure this doesn't happen. And uh, many people I talked to said, yeah, we did that in 2020. Now we are sick and tired. It's not about having a vision for the development of our country. We do not have a vision how to take care of society. Uh, this sense of insecurity, artificial intelligence, what will happen to my job? Am I going to be able to make a living in the future? These are the things that are not widely discussed, and people have a feeling they're not taken seriously. We just focus on the noise of the election campaign, but we do not very much talk about uh, the fact that both candidates have no clear vision what is going to happen to the country, how it's going to develop. Well, thank you for giving us an insight. We wanted uh, to spotlight, uh, shine a spotlight across the Atlantic. And I think this is what we did. And we'd like to thank you for being part of our discussion and have a nice lunch break now. Thank you. So, then here aufs Podium. Okay, first question on the panel goes to Mr. Bachmann. You have also been living in the US for over 10 years. Well, it's already 20 years. That's quite a long time. And uh, in 20 years, many things will have changed, of course. Do you share Ms. Buchter's impressions? And what are the impressions and ideas you would like to add? Do you also think that people are interested uh, in the election not, not, not taking them into account? Well, I have a similar opinion. Uh, when we look at the economic development figures, unemployment figures, I mean, the Biden economy had a historically wonderful result. But we learn this is not everything especially uh, when you live in an environment of very high inflation. What happened on a negative side was this high inflation. High inflation always means a loss of your living standard and a permanent loss of uh, living standard, even if uh, inflation reduces, and it has reduced uh, and is at a level of 2% as planned by the Fed. But all these losses uh, are still there. They just do not accumulate anymore. So uh, f nominal, there was no earned income tax credit for quite a while. Uh, after the uh, COVID pandemic, there used to be such a uh, wage supplement, especially for the catering sector. There was a massive subsidy. But real wages have been rising only slowly and only for the last year. So the trend. It, has changed, and I mean, if there were no elections, maybe the problems uh, would be less dramatic. But at the moment, we do not see the people that say, okay, we are happy because we have a kind of leveling out of our dire economic situation. And the central bank, uh, the Fed, had to increase interest rates. And increasing interest rate in an economy that is different from Germany. Consumption in the US is very much built on credit cards and debt. We have a house ownership rate of 70%, and most Americans would say they have a successful life if they have their own home. It's different in Germany. Uh, and the focus on home ownership uh, has something to do with the very bad rent situation. Uh, outside the big cities, uh, there is hardly an opportunity to rent a good uh, home. And um, students uh, may live in a rented apartment of poor quality, but most people want to live and do live in their own house. And uh, if you grew up in a situation where the mortgage rate was just 2 or 3%, and now it's 6 or 7%. Of course, that's quite a shock. And the dynamic labor market 
in the US that is much more dynamic than in Germany. The people cannot take new jobs because they cannot move to another place. If they have a house, they have to first of all pay their mortgage. They would have to uh, get a new mortgage at an interest rate of 6 to 7% if they have to move for the better job. So the better wage, the better salary you could get uh, must be enormous in order to make people move. And that leads to the frustration of people. Well, let's say I live in state A, I get a better job offered in another state, but people can't use that opportunity because of the high uh, mortgage interest rates. And so that is frustrating for people over and above. Then we have the migration crisis. It is uh, both an imagined, uh, uh, an imagined problem and also a real problem. From research, we know that in those regions where the opioid crisis was very bad. Republicans got most votes. And so one could say, I mean, a big pharma, big pharma, pharmaceutical companies uh, made people drug dependent and killed them in a way. But we know from social science research that most people say this opioid crisis has something to do with the crisis at our southern border. Uh, fentanyl is uh, smuggled across the border. Uh, that's a fact. And that also meant that whole regions got poorer. And the social level of cohesion has deteriorated. It was never very strong, but it got worse. How about the macroeconomic uh, topics in the election campaign? Do they get addressed by the uh, Americans? Uh, cost of living, of course, is always a macroeconomic topic and the high interest rates. I mean, interest rates are going down, but uh, by comparison, they are still high. And it will take quite a while for the interest rate to take effect and arrive at the mortgage market. Uh, that will happen only after Biden. Maybe uh, mortgage rates uh, will go down significantly only in a year from now. How about Biden's economic policy? Why is it not seen positively by the average American? It seems so positive from our perspective. Are there any reasons why Americans don't see it in that positive light? I was in the United States a couple of months ago, and of course, I looked at the forthcoming election. I also wanted to learn what could be relevant for us here in Europe and in Germany. And so I took a very close look at what they have done in recent years. I was in uh, Washington, I talked to one of Biden's uh, consultants and to see what has happened. I talked to a Republican senator in Virginia and looked at all the difficult issues, economic issues, drug issues, the Rust Belt, and the interconnections between all these topics. Then I also talked to the progressive people in New York. After 2016, they have tried to develop many new things, to develop a new approach in order to develop an economic policy that is really beneficial for the people, for the man in the street, so to say. And uh, let me give my answer based on my experience traveling to the US. Of course, we always focus on economic policy, labor market, and jobs. That was very successful during the Biden era. Uh, it had something to do with the Inflation Reduction Act, and it also had uh, something to do with the foreign trade policy vis-a-vis -vis China, vis-a-vis -vis Europe. I cannot um, talk about all the details, but we could really see a constant element in that policy. Tied labor market, that was a word that uh, I heard time and again during my trip. And that is, of course, seen by many people, and this is uh, assessed as a very positive thing. The second thing concerns the symbolical level. 
erinnert mich dieser ähm, republikanische Senator. This Republican Senator in Pennsylvania I talked to. I asked him to bring a few people that are important to him in, in his uh, electorate. And he uh, invited a few trade unionists. I mean, if you ask a Republican senator, he knew exactly who I am, a green and progressive member of German parliament. And that senator said, OK, let's invite uh, some trade unionists. And they said to me, we do not want the Democrats. Hillary is Wall Street. We are very far away from what the Democratic public Party stood for. It will be the same for Biden. It's the same for Harris. But then Biden gave the State of the Union address, and he talked to the Boss of the United Autos Union, while he talked to them, he tried to celebrate that we are once again one team, the Democratic Party and the trade unions, doing that uh, in front of the camera. And uh, it, there was also this belief that he is the first president on the picket line. Uh, in the White House, uh, they said, we are building the economy from the little out and the bottom up. That is to say, that was an attempt to sort of uh, link up the masses of the people with economic policy. They succeeded in doing that, and it had an effect. And that brings me to my third topic, namely the question of does that have an effect on, every day, on the everyday life of people? Uh, when I was there, they discussed one thing. I mean, Donald Trump at the time had issued checks with his face on, his portrait on, saying, OK, I give you a check, and that makes your life easier. You can use this check and go and buy things. And in Washington, they discussed, don't they need a kind of shelf in this supermarket with subsidized food on? That is to say, the basic uh, food saying uh, in, given to you by the president. That is say this question of the symbolical bridge, the big investment, development of infrastructure, new job creation. I could tell you thousands of stories and very touching moments in a steel factory that was closed down uh, right before I came. And a pulp and paper factory that uh, was opened at the very same time where people immediately found a new job. So things were happening, but uh, not everybody feels that in their everyday life. And the interesting thing is that Kamala Harris, in her opportunity economy that she keeps talking about, has put that as number one in her program. What are we going to do about food prices? What are going we going to do? about uh, price gouging. What are we going to do with uh, health care, drug prices? What are we going to do about rents? These are the questions that are really uh, very important for people. This is where people feel insecure, do not see a link between big politics and their day-to-day -day life. Okay. Uh, I would like to add something, if I may. All right. We know from research, from psychological research and economic research, that there is a sort of asymmetry for the Democrats. Let's talk about the German economic history. Think of the economic event which made Hitler powerful. What do you think of hyperinflation? Hyperinflation, that was 1923, so 10 years before Hitler came to power. But in the German memory, it's not the economic crisis and 6 million unemployed, it's the hyperinflation, which shows that infla inflation is considered toxic by human beings. They think it's unfair, they cannot defend themselves. However, if you get a job in the new good Biden econom economy, if you get a real salary increase by Biden, 
You don't go and say, thank you, Joe Biden. People tend to think, well, it's my right. It's good to have a good real wage. It's good to have a safe job. Inflation is amorphous. It's difficult to grasp. And that's what they blame politics for. But if it's better, if it gets better, if people find jobs and get better wages or salaries, that's what people consider is what they do themselves. And this is really mean. I mean, it's difficult for politicians to do something about this conviction and attitude. Right, but normally in politics, you're never elected for the things you do but it's uh, for the promises you make and the narratives you tell. That's what the campaigns are focusing on. But I would like to get back to the IRA and the measures which have been taken in the US connected to what I call the turn, i.e. getting away from WTO and global trade in Germany, in Europe, People reacted in a somewhat negative way. People said this is the new protectionism, and that's true. However, the question is, did it cause a damage to Germany and Europe, and to what extent? Is this a development that goes on on a global scale, or will things change, I wonder? Well, this has not have a negative impact on the German economy. The German economy has benefited a lot, a lot of investment and lots of positive things. So we have to see things as they are and we have to see them in a positive light. And then we also have certain protectionist rules in Europe too. So. I think we can be somewhat relaxed. I mean, people talked about Macron and Macron, he spoke about a trade war, but that's not true. And later, people said, well, couldn't this be taken as an example to show how investment in new technologies and climate protection can benefit a country? How can this be promoted? under the title, which means something very different, i.e. I'm acting against inflation. But it was necessary for, as an argument, in order to convince the public opinion. So I don't see things as dramatic as they are being described. Sometimes there is no peak. There is a stable line showing upward or going upward. It's not like one investing a lot and with respect to the elections. People tend to think that Kamala Harris and Trump will both stick to certain elements of the IRA. It's, it's easy to understand when it comes to Kamala Harris, when it comes to Trump, who tends to want to abolish what previous governments had said, well, he might be stopped by some of the states which have benefited from this law. And not everything is happening in the White House. A lot is happening in the Senate too, in the federal states. The overall situation will certainly be decisive. There is one more aspect I would like to ask you about. Because when talking about a trade war, we talk about China, right? So is that a topic which matters with respect to the electorate campaign of the next um, term? For four years, I've been the president of the American Chamber of Commerce. And China has always been an important issue in every conversation I've had since then. So this is certainly going to matter, but there is no real big difference between the two candidates, I'd say, here either, because both say China is an enemy. And the question is, to what extent? 
do they expect their partners to go along? Like, do they expect that Germany plays along? But here, too, I'd say both will try to support the U.S. labor market. They will promote the industrialization, and they will say that China is an enemy in this respect, which is why we'll have to undertake certain measures in order to do something about China, which is what Biden has done, too. The question is, do the allies have to play along? Partnership, European economy, U.S. economy, that's my keyword now. We do see differences, however, IRA, transformation policy, how is it done? There are targeted investments in the U.S., whereas in the EU, people are talking about CO2 prices or similar incentives, i.e. more control. Right? Is there a difference? And if so, what can be done? There is a different, which is because of the dysfunctionality of the U.S. political system. I know that the IRA is considered a positive tool, especially the Green Party and Robert Habeck consider it a positive tool. How? Ever. There are some aspects we need to consider. Nevertheless, I mean, why do they do climate protection via the IRA in America? I mean, there are three political categories in order to protect the climate, the CO2 price or public law, i.e. you ban certain things, like only heat pumps as of 2028, or you do subsidies, because before investment you have subsidies. So you can go for the subsidies approach. The first two options were impossible for the Biden administration. The U.S. administration cannot do it because the Senate has to pass laws with a 60-40 majority, i.e. they have to have the filibuster proof, as it's called, and these laws would have never been adopted by a democratically legitimated um, Senate because they never had a 60 to 40 majority. You do have the possibility to use financial laws because there is a certain reconciliation process. So a simple majority or 40 votes in a tie break would be sufficient in order to pass financial laws. In other words, if you wanted to do climate protection in the United States at all, you had to do it via the budget law. There is no, there was no other option. So you cannot include or introduce a CO2 price. So that's what they did. They did the budget thing. 50 or 51 senators, 50 plus the tiebreak of Harris were sufficient. Now, what does this mean, economy-wise? I mean, it's, it's of course good. The Americans had to do climate protection. It was uh, smart also in terms of political economy because who benefits? The red federal states like Georgia, Oklahoma, and thus there is hope that this will be maintained also with a Trump administration. So this is the way they did it, but it was the most expensive way of protecting the climate because you have lots of um, people who benefit from it because people who wanted to buy an e-mobile anyway are getting money for it now on top. So this is a problematic thing to do. Is it the right policy? I'd like to say yes, as seen from the U.S. perspective. And if it's good, well, the U.S. have enough capacity in order to get indebted, in order to raise debts on the financial market. Is it useful and reasonable? Well, it's not because it's much too expensive. You have much cheaper ways of doing it. So I'd be careful if it comes to 
considering this a model for Germany, but the can-do attitude could be a model. Like you go and say, okay, let's just do it. Finally do it. Let's start and protect the climate. Finally. But I'd be careful when it comes to specific constellations. You cannot really use this kind of approach here in Europe or in Germany. It's due to the particular political situation or condition in the U.S. Mrs. Menne. Back to you again. Do you think there is a model to be seen in what the current administration has done or what the Harris Walls campaign is meaning also for the debate in Germany and in Europe? Well, the good thing is it's easy to get. I can get a tax exemption or repayment, and it's easy to get. Well, that's the weakness of regulatory systems. It's much more difficult in Europe and in Germany. Indeed, you have to reach a goal here first before you get something. So that's different. But Mr. Bachmann is right. We do see lots of useless measures in the United States just in order to get money. But then... It's also much more difficult in the US, and it's already difficult in Germany, is to go and prescribe. I mean, they don't even want a social security system. They go and say everybody is in charge of their own happiness. So you are not even obliged to have a health insurance. So that's another problem, and there is a lot of psychology involved, no doubt. And, of course, you have this particular constellation in the United States or in Europe, respectively. So it cannot be done that easily here. However, it's interesting to note that people go and say there is the IRA in the U.S. And now I go and will close. I will close everything. But it's not that easy in the U.S. either. There are also lots of um, aspects which relate to the bureaucracy. There is a lot of red tape, and you have to solve some problems before courts. You cannot simply go and take it all and move to the U.S. Absolutely. A week ago, Ms. Harris introduced her economic program. And now, when you look at how she uses her economic program for the election campaign and how she talks to the Democrats. What do you think, Andreas, about uh, this program? Can it be a model role for our uh, political work? Uh, because in contrast to what we have in the United States, we always have a bad mood when it comes to policy making. Uh, a model role for Germany. And talking about the bad mood, I'm going to come back to that because tomorrow we are going to have the conference of employers. The model role first. I absolutely share your basic categories. We have three different ways of doing it. First of all, CO2 price, uh, legal stipulations, investment, and that also implies subsidies. And I think the experience that the U.S. has uh, is an experience that we already had. We know what it means when you're using price as uh, the instrument. And uh, at the beginning of this term of office, when Putin stopped delivering bo uh, gas, the prices went skyrocketing. The first people who said we need to do something to bring the price of Petrodal were the ones that usually want to have prices completely unregulated. Uh, I said it during the election already, FDP, the liberals are lying, and everybody who shares their perspective is lying. If they think they can control climate change on the basis of CO2 prices, uh, it is one element, but the idea that it is the only element that we can keep putting the CO2 prices uh, up all the time, that will not work as a sole instrument. Bans, legal prohibitions, the idea that uh, bans will give us the best result at the end of the day and very quickly, I don't believe in that. 
And I think what we need to do, and that is why um, it is worthwhile looking at the USA and learning from it, we need to think about investment. I mean, when we say we need to uh, refurbish the schools and we will have a better climate where children will learn a better way. We have to do the same for industry. We have to invest, be it in uh, Salzgitter Group, the chemical industry, nuclear power plants uh, that will be coupled with electrolyzers. Huge investment is required, and that will create uh, best results. If we invest into German railways, people uh, will have a better experience uh, taking a train, and we will have done climate protection. And also, when you look at Berlin, I mean, the old and uh, bad rail cars, nobody knows how long they are going to run. Nothing is financed, nothing is clearly structured when it comes to modernizing the rolling stock. So uh, we need to reform the uh, uh, debt situation, we need to uh, combine climate protection with positive, positive experience for the people. Otherwise, it won't work. We need all three instruments. We need a CO2 price plus uh, climate money. We need regulatory instruments. But what we are still missing, what we need to discuss, is the element of uh, investment and a much higher level of investment. Otherwise, I think all this society is going to explode since we have such a high transformation pressure. And one more sentence or half a sentence about the bad moods uh, amongst the policymakers. I mean, we came into power when Germany was in a situation where we had a very poor industrial situation. It's a long-term problem that we had to take care of. Then we had so many crises uh, accumulating the supply chain crisis post-pandemic, COVID pandemic. Secondly, uh, Putin has just stopped 55% of all the gas deliveries. And we had to find an answer, not by closing our companies and industries, we had to find alternative uh, gas, and we uh, had an unprecedented level of renewable energy developing. So of course, if we have a bad mood, it has something to do with the uh, bad situation. But uh, uh, the bad mood should not be as bad as it is, uh, because people forget all the things that were done by the present German government. Now let me come back to you. When we look at the CO2 price, we also look at an instrument uh, that can make people angry, just like uh, inflation. I mean, the CO2 price, uh, if they want uh, a CO2 price and, and, and no, do not add climate money, well, he's lying. Uh, we say, I mean, CO2 prices and redistribution. Um, because we want to give people something. Of course, you have to be willing and ready to uh, redistribute. And I see no political party that wants to really engage in redistribution of funds. Uh, I wanted to say something different. I'm quite surprised that the left party looks at Harris and her economic policy program. She talks about uh, tax uh, increases for rich people as of an annual income of 400,000 plus. That would um, concern me, unfortunately, but it's a good idea. And that should be a left-wing policy. All these transformations and investment, I mean, when we talk about railways, we need to invest because it's a, a public service that needs to be there. But of course, we need a lot of private investment, not only government investment. We need a kind of a governance for the next uh, 20 years in order to bring down consumption. We cannot have both more investment and more consumption. And so at the end of the day, it's about arithmetic. We need to somehow reduce our consumption and Probably it cannot be the consumption of uh, those people 
We're not very rich anyway. So uh, what we have to reduce is consumption of uh, the rich. It's pure macroeconomic arithmetic, and left-wing parties should focus on that particular program. Tax reliefs for the low and medium income citizens and higher taxes for the well-to-do, for the rich, plus investment so that we can enter into a decade of investment. And that needs also a level of reduction in terms of uh, consumption. Now, uh, you have uh, given an idea to Andreas Aldrich, uh, and uh, he, he has already made a statement about that. Maybe he wants to repeat. Let me say three things. First of all, let me come back to increasing prices. When a party has experience uh, talking about prices. It's our party. During this term of office, I focused on the heating law, and uh, I've seen so many difficult situations. And I'm very proud of how we managed to come to terms with all the problems. We had collateral damage. Uh, it's hard for us, and it was also hard for society. But now we have analyzed our experience. We have learned our lesson. And I would say nobody in the German political arena will be able to survive if the prices of petrol are high and nothing is being done about that. I mean, you have to somehow be in line with what people want. Otherwise, climate protection will never be successful. Then the second question concerned distribution, redistribution, and investment. Of course, we need to invest into goods that then will be available. Like we need to repair our schools. We need to improve the situation of German railways. We need to modernize infrastructure bridges and so on and so forth. Therefore, we will have to incur debt. Everywhere in the trade unions, the uh, companies, the uh, federal association of uh, suppliers, the EU and so on and so forth. Everybody says we need investments, massive investment. And therefore, in order to make it happen, we need to reform the so-called debt break. We also need a different debate about how to finance the software. We need to give better pay to educators. We need to have social workers everywhere. We need to strengthen communities in Germany. All these are areas where we need investment and we need large-scale investment. Look at the payment structures uh, here in Berlin in kindergartens and also other social institutions. Also look at the uh, payment of people working in healthcare. It will cost a lot of money to improve pay, and therefore we need a tax policy that is focused on justice and in those areas where, they have, where we have most injustice in society. Uh, with Katharina Beck, uh, we have just done an analysis. Uh, we could uh, generate uh, tens of billions of money if, uh, for instance, people speculate uh, buy up real estates and uh, keep that real estate for 10 years, knowing that if they sell then, they don't have to pay taxes. For inheritance tax, you need to pay. Uh, if you uh, get uh, as if you inherit a huge company, uh, you will not pay any inheritance tax. That would also be changeable and would generate a lot of income. I could give many of these examples, and uh, I think we can start tackling those issues. Of course, we need to tackle income tax. Of course, we will have to relieve the tax burden uh, of many people, especially those with small and medium incomes. That will have repercussions on uh, those people at the very top. We are going to write our program, our election program, and then we will be very clear about the figures. So this was our discussion about uh, what can we learn from the United States uh, based on 
the positive results achieved in the United States. As we said, many of the positive results were never really felt by the man in the street. But let me now come back to the United States. We haven't talked so much about the candidates and their programs. Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, they have their programs. And they want to use their election campaign and give an answer on what is the way ahead for the future in the U.S. What are the central challenges uh, that are in store for the United States? And how is that different from the European Union? Do we see any differences here? And what do you expect will happen, uh, depending on who is going to be president? Well, the interesting uh, situation will be the constellation of the new government, what can be decided, what will be the distribution of power in the Congress and Senate, and where would be the levels where you will have mutual blockades and you can only agree on the very essential things. Uh, well, there will be a focus on the budget, uh, and uh, then even a standstill. Uh, well, the budget ceiling must be increased. Uh, the debt level is very high, and I think they do not have much room for a maneuver. Because even for the United States, uh, the limit is the limit, and they can't do, they can't keep on going like forever. And that is why there is the idea of tax increases or tariff increases or tax redistributions. I personally think the results, independent of who is going to win, uh, the result will be not be so very different. I mean, uh, Trump has got different topics. He talks not about geopolitics, but about economics. During the last presidency, um, business did not suffer, neither the German business nor the American business. Well, if we look at uh, our situation, let's talk about uh, the things we just already discussed in the beginning. There is this social divide, and that social divide is increasing also in Germany. A social divide uh, creates enemy images, uh, and the enemy image is usually uh, somehow linked to migration, because that's the easy solution. It's easy for people who are angry, and we heard many Americans are angry. Because, for instance, they cannot buy a home anymore. and. The moment they are angry, they are susceptible to demagogues, and that's very important in American politics. And the economic policy here is only partly an engine that improves. Uh, Ms. Harris's economic program is an acceptable program. The question really is, can she really get it done? Can she really implement it? Uh, Mr. Biden, for instance, didn't do all the things he promised for the trade union, like, for instance, the steel and aluminium agreement that we would have wanted to see could not be done against the uh, will of the trade union. And so there will be many more stakeholders, many more players in both situations influencing what ultimately will be done. As far as business is concerned, uh, of course, things need to be financed. More risk distribution, that's what I see for the Democrats. Maybe more tax reliefs for private business. Uh, th those effects at the end of the day combined could mean that people have more money in their pockets. So I have a very differentiated view about it. And uh, my major concern is, uh, well, uh, there will be a blockade in the, in the Senate and uh, houses and nothing will happen. Now, the civil society, that's also a topic. I heard a podcast a while ago, and people said that they hope that 
with further development, democracy will be saved. But the question is, how much democracy will there be then? So lots of things have been introduced by the Biden administration. But was it worthwhile? I mean, has whatever has happened come or happened in time? And what does matter still today? We've just said that we cannot simply do away with a number of things, but what are the aspects which have a chance these days with uh, um, Harris, for example, in terms of further development? Now, we tend to say, apparently, it doesn't make a difference who wins, but that's not true, I'd say. Is think, I think it makes a, a huge difference also in terms of the economic programs. The economic programs are different, very different. I mean, it's different from Germany, of course, where state debt is not a problem right now. But state debt is a problem in the U.S. these days, and it reduces the room for maneuver for any new government. But then there is also the political dysfunctionality, and we do see a lot of state debt in the U.S., which is very different from what we see in Germany. So there is a certain path you cannot go because otherwise the system of debt might crash. I mean, then the question is, of course, where should they get money from? They cannot go to China. Yeah, that goes for the Europeans too. Yeah, right. This is clearly a limitation, but we should not pretend that there is no difference. I mean, if people go, if people ask Trump, how will you pay for what you promise? He says, customs and the foreigners will pay. This is not a theory, it's nonsense. I mean, of course, you could go and say he doesn't mean it. But yes, he does. So we cannot go and say, well, the first four years, Trump, we survived. It's not going to be that bad now. But the situation is very different in the first term. Trump was surprised. I mean, he did not really expect to win. I mean, he, he, he had to pick people among your traditional um, serious Republicans who he kicked out, of course, towards the end of his term. But today it's different. So we don't have any adults anymore in the room left. So the situation will be very different. We will see democracy suffer, and we will also see it in the economic context. And if it comes to customs, this means that the cost of living will increase even more. And he will certainly ruin the US economy. So the fact that Harris also has protectionist impulses, however, she also has a balance Trump does not have. So that's an important aspect. So it's not like doesn't matter who wins. And Harris has a clear economic program, which is different from Trump. You might go and criticize, but all in all, it's reasonable, it's balanced. I mean, the Democrats are not really good in terms of election campaigns. That's always the case anyway. Nobody knows, hardly anybody knows this program. People don't really know what this economic program is about. And even if people go and ask, what about your economic policy? They tend to say, well, why don't you check it out on our website? I mean, we'd, 
wish for a bit more enthusiasm when selling this particular proposal. She hasn't done this so far. So yes, I'd say there is a major difference in terms of economic policy, also with respect to the democracy and foreign policy, of course, to things will change also, and it's going to be worse for Europe. How can we prepare? That was a question you asked me, I'd say, yeah, enhance our weapons, our defense budget as much as you can. Well, that's certainly a difficult perspective, and we really were not prepared when Trump won last time. Now the question is, indeed, also in view of the fact that it's still quite open, who will win on 5th November? 11th November is what I said before, but that's carnival, so that's another story. So are we prepared? Are we better prepared than we were last time? Do we have, have we learned our lessons? Well, last time we tumbled into a situation that was true here and in the US, that was 2017, but a lot has happened since then. On the one hand, there was an attempt to introduce a new economic policy. At the same time, there is an attempt which has to be made with respect to saving democracy. That was a process that started already in 2016. And it's interesting if you look at the overall situation. Remember progressive circles in New York and otherwise and elsewhere who asked the question, what do we need in order to have a good result in the end? The question was not how much do we have, which law, what act, but the question was, what do we need in order to get a better outcome? And people started working on a systematic approach in order to enhance the infrastructure, in order to really have something positive brought into society in the United States. There were long lists of people made in order to check also the interconnections. And a new deal was developed with Bernie Sanders and others who moved slowly into the center of the political party. And Joe Biden, a Democrat representing the center of the party, adopted this policy. So there is a substantial difference with respect to the question who will win the election and what will be the impact, because the policy in the United States, which can be implemented, is very different today. So it's about enhancing or improving the economic situation and saving democracy. What happened in the past was driving people away from democracy and the creation of enemy images. I mean, we, this is what we see in Germany. And otherwise, people talk about justice in a triangle between money for the citizen and refugees and better salaries, and it's always the same circle, and people are repeating the same arguments, and people are being taught time and again, and told time and again, that this is the major problem in our society, and those who have the biggest problems don't see how they can get out of this particular um, dire situation, and this is also killing the United States from within. And this is what happened in the last few years in the United States. And there was an attempt made to turn it. I mean, I don't know whether it was in time, but this remains to be seen. And for us, the question is whether it's going to be a big or a small difference, but we will clearly have to change things. And we have to see already now that we are involved in a power struggle of the big continents and parts of the world. China is investing billions, billions. They are investing in new technologies and green technologies. This is not about green policy. This is about technology leadership at the end of the 21st century. And then there is the United States by keeping the solar panels out. 
And I say, now these are being produced by the Uyghurs, and we do have a human rights law, so we cannot be protectionist. So we get all these solar panel, panels, and we cannot really produce them. So this industry is about dead. Actually, we do have a few left in Germany, in Bitterfeld, Wolfen. So here you clearly see an industry where a power struggle is raging. And the same will happen in the automotive industry unless we are willing to embark on this dispute and unless we are really trying hard to produce the products here and the technology here. But this will cost something. We won't get it for free. And at the end of the day, there will be a dispute between a U.S. policy focusing very much on their own needs, a policy in China focusing very much on their own needs, and a policy in Europe, which will at the end of the day say we can't do anything because the market will solve the problem. That's naive. It's really gullible. And I, I'm sometimes actually in despair because I think we have to be aware of the fact that there are things going to happen and we need to be aware of what. Yeah, but all this means that we are not well prepared. There are two more weeks to go, no matter what the elections will bring. If there is someone who goes and says that he will raise the customs rate by 100, 200, 500, 1,000 percent, I mean, of course, you might go and say he won't do this because he's smart enough to know what this will mean for the U.S. economy. And yet, just assume he does it. Nobody in Europe or in Germany knows what could be done, right? I, I, I just don't believe that there is anybody who knows because this is a very destructive way of action, of acting. It's uh, playing without any rules and you cannot react because we don't have any rules for it. Yeah, I mean, he's crazy enough to talk about the protective clauses of NATO. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we don't have to invest in Europe. This needs to be done, and we have to speak with one voice, and we have to be strong. That's the only option we have in order to move into the future. But the reaction... In, in view of human beings, and often it's individuals who don't play to the rules, is are difficult to do in a regulated system. Can I give you an example? Let's talk about resilience. Two winters have passed in which we don't know whether we have enough antibiotics and cough syrup for children in our society. There was a law, a law was made so that we pay higher prices, so that we get more antibiotics for the kids, so that we can import more. At the same time, this shows what happens once you have global power fights. A Chinese government will never go and say before, cameras, this is a an economic war with Germany, and that's why we don't get the product anymore. But the ship, which is going to bring it, won't reach the harbor of Hamburg or Rotterdam anymore. We won't get the resources anymore, the raw materials. The automotive industry needs prefabricated products and raw materials from China. I mean, we are depending on them. That's what I'm saying. So unless we go up, I mean, look at the CHIPS Act. The U.S. used the CHIPS Act in order to act against China in order to uh, keep them from producing particular chips. So right now we have a big company from the Netherlands which has major problems in doing business with China because of this law made in the U.S. So when it comes to raw materials, when it comes to the production of particular technical fundamental things we need in order to keep our econ economy running, or when it comes to cough syrup for children in winter, we are not prepared, we are not resilient. That's what I'm saying. We cannot really counter anything. That's the problem. Oh, rare earth. 98% dependency. Francisca Brunner says it takes 10 years to be less dependent, so we are not prepared. And the question that we have is, are we prepared? 
to come to terms with a disruptive policy on top of everything. We have the economic dependencies we have to overcome. But then we also have to have a way of handling people that play according to different rules, the rules that are different from what they think they should be and how they were in the old world with the WTA. TO. I mean, uh, it's a question of uh, resilience. A disruptive policy is a shock, like a weather event. You have to take it uh, for what it is. And then resilience is the only thing uh, that, that helps. I agree to many things that was said by Mr. Outrich, and these are the questions we will have to ask. Which products, which industries? must be concentrated in Europe. Not necessarily in uh, Germany. Not everything has to be in Germany. We hope very much that uh, the EU is going to survive. Oh, that seems to be the crux of the matter. When we talk about these challenges, massive challenges, where we say the first success was already achieved by the European Commission and Ms. von der Leyen. How strong is this basis? How sure are we that we can only catch up uh, and come to terms with the future if we have a common European uh, procurement and sovereignty policy? Well, uh, that must be tested. We need to have a stress test regarding the level of solidarity in Europe. I mean, we can have our question marks about that. So look at the solidarity level with Ukraine. We as Western Europeans uh, only have a limited level of solidarity with the Eastern Europeans. And of course, then we have the crazy actors like Orban. And the EU has found no way of some sort of coming to terms with him. What is he still doing in the EU? That, that is a question that would be legitimate. I mean, these uh, geostrategic decisions will have to be taken, and they cost money. Of course, it's an inevitable cost that we then, as politicians, have to tell the people about. And of course, we cannot conserve and save all, uh, all sectors of industry. I mean, uh, of course, we need resilience as far as uh, automotive industry is concerned and as far as uh, pharmaceutical production is concerned. For the solar panels, I do not quite agree. Uh, it's a mass product. It can be produced by so many countries. Uh, I mean, uh, the US can uh, deliver, produce and deliver solar panels. Uh, or we can also get them from Brazil and uh, India. Many countries of the world are going to produce them. So. Here we have to diversify. That is something we do not have to do ourselves. I think uh, we missed the leadership in that sector anyway. So we have to have a look, close look at the industries, analyze the different sectors. Of course, technological leadership is uh, important. And we also have to look at industries that are relevant for national security. Uh, for cars, uh, it's both things. I don't want to drive a car where artificial in intelligence coming from China can switch off my brakes. So I would uh, say it's really relevant for security. The solar panels, as I said, well, I mean, could mean for five years or so we won't have any new uh, solar panels. Might be bad for the climate, but at the end of the day, we find a solution. Decisions need to be taken. Political decisions will be uh, taken. These will be skirmishes and struggles, uh, and that is the only way to ultimately achieve resilience. Let me hand back to you, Ms. Mender. In recent years, it was so attractive to go to the United States and uh, relocate your production there. Uh, investment was carried out. Is that something, is that a trend that is here to stay or is it going to change? And what does it mean for us? I mean, do we have an opportunity? Do we have a chance to change that trend?
It's, uh, it's been a trend for decades. The German companies are present, uh, invest in the United States, in China. Uh, American companies also invest here. We have seen a couple of American companies investing in Germany. Thank God. Now, the entrepreneurial decision always depends on whether I've got a market there. I do have this skilled labor. Can I produce there? What are the rules of the country? What is the uh, tax rate? What does energy cost? So when we talk to our members, they say, when we look at uh, taxes and energy costs, they're too high in Germany. They've been saying that for years and years. What I'm concerned about, both for US and Germany, is that companies are afraid to invest because they believe that the rules are not long-term rules that won't be changed. I mean, if I take 10 million or 50 million and invest, I want to know that uh, three or five years from now, I can still use my biomass. But if you have your doubts whether the rules are going to change, you won't invest. Um, this is what I can say here. Much depends in the United States on the federal states. Their companies, of course, will have their contacts to the people in the federal states, the governors, and uh, oftentimes, independent who uh, rules the national state, the governors want to have jobs, and they will make things possible that would not have been possible in Washington. When Trump said, we are leaving the climate uh, agreement, there were federal states that said, no, we'll stay in the climate agreement. And this is also a motivating factor for companies. This is how they and why they invest. And the same goes for American companies in Germany. They also look at, uh, where do I go? Do I go to Schleswig-Holstein because the electricity prices are lower, or do I go to Bavaria because I need to be close to the automotive sector? Recently, somebody asked me about Intel's decision to postpone their investment. Uh, they asked me, uh, is that a result of uh, what the voting result was for the regional uh, parliament? I mean, uh, nobody would ask Volkswagen, are you going to a blue or a red state? Uh, hardly ever such a decision is motivated by political factors. It's always an entrepreneurial decision. Companies have uh, invested and they want to stay for many years and they know in the meantime there are going to be political changes and they try to develop their own resilience. Uh, before we have another round of questions, uh, might there be windows of opportunity where we in Europe can sort of strengthen our own resilience? What would be the prerequisites for us to become independent of the situation, the outcome of elections in the United States? We do have structural problems. I try to sort of uh, put it in a nutshell. And these structural problems have not finally been settled. Of course, that has something to do with the, with the red tape, the bureaucratic burden. We need to reduce red tape. Then we have a uh, major labor shortage and a specialist shortage. Uh, it's a political problem. I was in Brandenburg, Thuringia, and Saxony. I met uh, with many companies. And no wonder uh, what the result of the election is. I mean, the question is, uh, do you get skilled labor? It's a very important uh, thing for companies. Do I have skilled labor in the region? I could talk about so many things about uh, wages and uh, retirement pensions. Uh, energy prices will be a very important topic. Then the situation is that we need to invest massively into grid development, uh, the increase in the level of, of renewable generation. 
So we have to sort of find a solution. We need to finance it through credits uh, or we need to invest. It's a one-time investment, then renewables will be the cheapest. But uh, the upfront investment will be required to have uh, long-term affordable prices. And then I would agree to Ms. Mena, we need to give uh, companies a sense of security of what will happen next. It is very detrimental for companies the way we debate future technologies and economic uh, developments. And that is not a question of party politics, uh, because I very much uh, agree to what Ms. von der Leyen uh, does on the European level. Uh, she has decided to go with us instead of Miss Meloni. Uh, she has decided to say, okay, let's start the process towards a Green New Deal. The Merz CDU here declares every new technology be a uh, clash of cultures, and that has massive repercussions. Uh, what happened in the heating industry? Uh, next week, I'm going to be at Stiebel Eltron. I'm going to talk to the people there. And they tell you what it means if you have a slump in production because people don't believe in the technology anymore. The uh, car manufacturers, they come to my office and say, uh, Mr. Aldrich, uh, let's make sure that we follow this track. We got uh, fully accustomed to renewables, electromobilities, uh, making the transition work. Millions and billions were invested. If all of that will be overthrown again, we would do the worst thing we could do for business in Germany. We would ruin their perspectives. And that is the good thing that happened in the US as well. First of all, there was a commitment regarding future-proof technologies. Secondly, the financial framework put in place in order to create a business case. It all of a sudden made sense to invest into batteries and fuel cells. And then one thing came. Uh, private money went into these technologies. And this is the moment really things move forward. And here in Germany and in Europe, we must be very careful about the way we debate things. Every time we make a step forward, we discuss negative things and take a step back. That's bad for climate protection, and that's bad for business. All right, that's worth a round of applause. And now we will take our audience's question. Uh, our colleague has prepared the questions that came in. I've tried to collect a few questions. Uh, there were many questions regarding the triangle of Europe, US, China. Let me summarize them and le uh, let me ask you to be brief in your answers. How about the conflict with uh, China? Can it strengthen US-European relations? Or are the uh, uh, U.S. going to indulge in self-isolationism? And how about the NATO relations after the U.S. elections? Back to geopolitics. Uh, Ms. Mena, would you like to start? China is a huge market for Germany and for German businesses. And if we sort of close the door to that market, it will hardly have a positive effect. And should there be uh, blocks saying, oh, well, those will trade only with one uh, side and those will only trade with the other side, that's bad. We as Amcham, we say we need free trade. Uh, free trade is uh, not a good word at the moment, but basically everybody can prosper if everybody trades with everyone. Uh, as far as NATO is concerned, I cannot say anything about it. Well, you mentioned the security dimension while mentioning Ukraine, and I would like to connect it to the first aspect. You mentioned and say, well, we could prepare in a resilient way by preparing free trade with other regions in the world in an efficient way. Why haven't we made the agreement with Canada yet for Example, I mean, cannot ca can't we have a free trade with uh, Canada, Latin America, Africa? I mean, we have to 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 act 
in a geostrategic way, if you talk to German diplomats in Africa, you learn that the Chinese are not really favorable there anymore, also because of the human rights. And this is also about paying uh, credits back and uh, Beijing is very rigid when it comes to any problems here, so we might offer better conditions. So we should really look at what is happening in the world, and instead of being between the blocks, we should try and establish better relations with other parts of the world. There have been some initiatives, but uh, we actually need a an EU High Commissioner for Africa Relations. And the Canadians, let me say it again, the Canadians love to have good relations with uh, Germany. The federal government has started off, started well, but more can be done. And then? If the Americans we treat from a certain or retire from a certain region, we should not just go and say, okay, they are gone. A lot of what I would recommend will certainly be extremely expensive and won't be easy, but there is no other option unless you want to have Western Europe be a de facto colony of Russia. Yeah, right, but we're talking about the Chinese, Thomas. They are, so to speak, the counter pole. But they have established a close, uh, close links and an established a network with the BRICS states. So the question is whether a High Commissioner for Africa will really help us. <laughs> Yeah, but Europeans can offer other credit conditions. Nobody likes the Chinese in Africa, but then they are still the only ones who are there. But then, if you talk to the people in the countries in the south, the situation is a bit different, and BRICS and competition, well, it's a bit bigger than China. Yes, indeed, we are in a somewhat difficult situation because you want brief answers, but that's difficult. So let me try, nevertheless. I negotiated the trade agenda with the SPD and the FDP in this term. And Germany has a trade policy voice again. We were blocked in the past. There were a number of problems, like the ratification of PETA, for example, which part of the Green Party members or sympathizers don't really like, to put it mildly. On the other hand, we need more trade and more collaboration with many parts of the world, because it's true what you say. If we don't do it, it's not like nobody else will do it, but China will do it, and they will do it in completely different constellations. Let me explain. We won't get an extensive trade agreement with the United States. TTIP is dead, will remain dead. And that's what Congress tells us, too. So this is about the attempt to move forward on a technical level, like uh, standard adjustments, like why is a certain product or a machine um, licensed here but not licensed in the US? And you have to do everything twice if you want to have a product or a machine licensed or admitted. So this can be solved, and then on a global scale, and this is what I realized when negotiating the Mercosur agreement, we need to make sure how a standard-based policy can work so that the other side 
benefits. I mean, that's the core. That's what it's all about. We, the Green Party, won't be able to ratify an agreement like the Mercosur, which does not include the humanity question of saving the Amazon. We won't be able to do this. I mean, this is a geopolitical question. So we won't be able to do this uh, Mercosur agreement. But I was also a member of the DT Trade um, in Brussels, and we talked about all the details, and we tried to figure out what it what it is that people in the Amazon region benefit. So that President Lula says at the end, this is what we want. I mean, he needs to sell the proposal too. And he and they want to protect the Amazon. And they learn that they will never, ever go and implement standards which are being dictated from Europe as long as there is the colonial history and the pain and suffering involved. So all this has to be considered. It's not possible to simply ignore it. So it has to be accepted. So we have to really deepen all the relations, and we have to try hard and work hard to do this. Well, the societal and social model in Europe is much more exciting, and we have to sell it. Young people in Africa don't want to spend a year in Beijing. But they want to go to London or Paris or Berlin, maybe also to New York and uh, Washington. But once they have a proto-fascism there made by Trump, they won't want to go there either. So that's what we need to see. That's what we need to bear in mind. I mean, we cannot look at Africa or Latin America any longer with the perspective of the colonial empire, right? We need to meet them at eye level. We need to acknowledge that they can deliver, that they have things we need. They might offer human capital and other things. So if we really manage to establish relations at eye level, equal ones based on equality, Instead of projecting the cultural dominance of Europe all the time, it's going to be better. Now, then I need to ask Simone Menne again. Are there players in the industry, in the economy, who would demand such an economic policy from the European Union? They did. The, the policy based on equality on an eye level approach in order to have real partnership with the global south, which would be uh, competing to the Chinese approach and which would also consider the hardship of life, but also the wish for freedom. It's not only about the benefit of common trade. Yes, it, absolutely. There are lots of enterprises which clearly show what kind of uh, trade making or supply chain is feasible. And they're not only focusing on these directives and uh, supply chains. I mean, you cannot go and say this is a whole industry, but most entrepreneurs have realized that they benefit more if there is partnership with the country they are active in. I used to work with Lufthansa in the past. It worked well with China, actually. But then it toppled. So yes, it can be done. And it will certainly be less once we have the CASAD, i.e. the obligation of reporting also with respect to sustainability, also social sustainability. But we are talking about human beings. These are human beings. They have children, and they also have values in mind. Right, so we are hoping for a common ground. Back to you, Philip. Yes, the U.S.-Chinese relations. Now, what about the industry policy in China and the question? came up 
what should a European industry policy look like? I mean, everybody said we need a lot of money, but what does it mean? How will you use the money? Andreas. Andreas. Ich wiederhole nicht noch mal die strukturellen Fragen. Die hatte ich gerade. Now, in order to answer this question about support for or promotion for the economy in Europe and the support granted by China, I mean, this has to be balanced, right? The level playing field, which has been mentioned in the past so often does not exist right now. China is subsidizing a lot. China is also imposing regulations on German companies producing in China. They make uh, plots of land available for free. They are subsidizing exports and so on. So it's difficult to compare. We cannot compare. And even if people go and try it again and again and insist on the market economy approach, they ignore consciously the fact that this is a context in which there is no market economy. So we might want to use our trade policy tools, which is what the automotive industry is talking about in Europe right now. This is about customs, and this is not the one size fits all customs covering a whole industry, but they went and asked which advantages do which companies have in China. They were looking at different companies, and based on this, they talked about customs tariffs, which differ in order to reestablish the level playing field. So that's one option, and the other is pertaining to the question whether we can negotiate a solution, which is why it's really a problem that Germany decided to opt out of the overall European approach. And Scholz went and told Volkswagen, we are on your side. But this is an internal logic, and it does not accept and acknowledge that there is a global situation, because we need negotiations in order to establish a level playing field field between China and Europe. And if you don't want to use, if you don't want to compete with China on the customs tariff field, you have to support European or German companies, could be tax credits like the ones we see in the United States. Or we also had it, by the way, in our um, gross chances law. It's also been negotiated with the federal parliament and the uh, federal council. But the uh, financial ministers of the federal state said this cannot be done. But we have re-entered the idea. The question is, what can be done in order to have tax credits benefit companies? How can we support in a targeted way so that companies have future technologies implement. That's the question we need to talk about. I guess this means we have to change the, the European treaties. Yes, right now we do have opening clauses, which still allow for such an approach, but they will close eventually after a while. Maybe they will be continued. Maybe there will be a follow up, but we really need a European answer to these questions. And we are in a situation which is a bit more difficult than what we were in a year ago when um, the German Supreme Court ruled about the next generation EU. This was for the first time allowing to take credits in order to implement programs. Uh, Lucke and other German politicians complained to the Federal Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe. I was there. I followed the trial, the process. This was decisive because decisive because this was about promoting major European investment programs. The Federal Constitutional Court has left a little door open, so this could be done. Well, the, the financial uh, 
The financial institutions of the federal states can't do it. It has something to do with the dysfunctionality. Uh, of a, maybe they they can do it after all, and they just pretend they, they don't. But really, this is not the way to go forward. Mr. Aurich already mentioned a number of structural problems that we have, like uh, jobs or shortage of labor skilled labor. The other topic, uh, the other problem is education. I mean, uh, we've done a little bit, but uh, every time we have a piece of study, we ha get a shock. We get shocking results, but nobody cares. Uh, we have our structural dysfunctionalities in Germany. And that also concerns the capacity of uh, the state's institutions and uh, the incapacity of the regional financial institutions or tax authorities to pay out the tax credits, that is something that we need to tackle immediately. Now let me come back to the original question. I would do both things, ask Europe. I should look at the regions of the world that want to play fair play. There we will have free trade, there we'll have a proper market. And of course, that means uh, that Africa must get uh, much better access to our markets. And we are also very protectionist. We don't want to grant them full access. But if Africa wants to play fair play with us, we need to open to them as well. And in the theory of international relations, there are always two opportunities to deal with another region. Have free trade and markets. You can offer it to those who want to have it. And for some, it might be attractive because Europe still is an attractive and very big market. And others who don't want to have this fair play uh, and want to use their strategies there, we should have counter strategies instead of being naive. And there I would apply to principles resilience. What are the areas that we want and need to cover ourselves and national security? These are the two areas where we need to focus on a strategy vis-a-vis -vis those regions that do not want to pay a fair play with us and do not want to work with us on an equal footing. Philip, any other question? I can see people are uh, a bit tired and uh, thirsty. And that is now my last question. It also came from our audience. And who is going to be president? This central question. I already have noted another question as a final question. What gives us hope? When we look at the United States. Uh, at the moment, we talk a lot about dystopias. We just talked about security. Also, Harris administration is not going to answer all questions for us, like what are we going to do with Ukraine? Sometimes we have a feeling, well, if Harris gets, uh, gets elected, everything will be fine. Sometimes I think it won't be the case. But what gives us hope when we look at the United States at the moment and what do you think will be the outcome of the election? And I'll start with you. I'm not going to answer the first question. Uh, it's such a difficult uh, thing to forecast. Nobody can give an answer because it takes just very little votes to decide the outcome. What gives us hope? We have the Amcham Germany. And uh, that is an institution that is over 100 years old. And there were so many crises between our states in the meantime. But last but not least, we have our common foundation. And we can also see it uh, uh, in the election campaign, the attitude of Americans that would be good for us to follow, that let's do it mentality. What can always be done? no matter which country and political regime you're talking to. You need to find the right people with whom you can make a plan and implement it. And I think you find them everywhere, and you can find them particularly in the United States. That gives us hope. Okay, thank you. So, Andreas Aldrich, 
I'll be really brief. What gives us hope? Kamala Harris and the movement that carries her, not her as a person alone, but also the direction she wants to take. It's a, a direction that was uh, prepared many years ago. And who is going to win the election? Kamala Harris. Uh, OK, I also hope that she would win. But I wouldn't want to make a forecast. Uh, what gives me hope for the Harris campaign is the micro phenomena. Ms. Mena addressed them already. In many swing states in the Midwest, the Republicans don't have a very solid basis. They can't even carry out their election campaign in the street. And really, uh, it is important now that uh, you can uh, contact people and you can ask them, when do you go to vote? Have you voted already? It may mean at the end of the day, 40 to 50,000 votes, but it, it can be the decisive majority. In my own home state in uh, Michigan, uh, the state Republicans were taken over by MAGA and they are so dysfunctional. They have their internal uh, quarrels and basically they have a no ground game anymore. I was told in Wisconsin it's uh, similar. Pennsylvania is a bit better. They are the uh, the uh, uh, senator and candidate has developed a uh, ground game. Uh, Magar is too dysfunctional to do it, and that gives me hope. These are the things you don't see in the opinion polls. What will be uh, the turnout? Uh, of course, uh, uh, the uh, Muslim vote, there, must, uh, there are some who are not very positive about Harris. That's the wild card. So it's uh, going to be a very narrow outcome. Mrs. Menu said it, uh, the hope for the United States is that Germany, that uh, the United States more than Germany are a very de decentralized country. My personal life, living in Michigan, with the Democratic uh, Congress, uh, we have uh, the governors, uh, a blue governor, and uh, Trump will have no much power over my life, with the exception of income tax. Unless he starts being a real fascist and tries to abolish state institutions. This has happened in the 30s in Germany. If he cannot do that, then for the average American who is a citizen and not an illegal person, for the illegals, it's really very, uh, very bad. Uh, even uh, the state authorities will not be able to protect them if the federal forces move in. But for the average America, American, not much is going to change in a Trump, Trump administration unless he goes really down the road of fascism. Uh, but for Europe, I would have little hope and uh, no hope at all for Ukraine. Ukraine. So that was related uh, to the possible Trump administration. That gives you no hope. Uh, the hope vis-a-vis -vis the federal states, of course, is uh, you have a reason to talk about that. Uh, of course, that during the first Trump administration was good for climate protection. Uh, and the Heritage Foundation has said that uh, new things will come if he gets into power. So we are still thrilled about the uh, 5th of uh, November. Heike has been with us during her lunch break, and that is why I'd like to ask her, do you want to um, make a statement at the end of uh, our conversation? Uh, what have you learned from that debate, and uh, what do you think will happen during the coming weeks in the run-up to the election, and what do you think might be the outcome? The debate was very interesting. You mentioned many things that I could subscribe to. I also think that another Trump administration would be very much different from the first one, because today he is surrounded by completely different people, and they have 
plans, not only the 2025 plan, but also other plans they want to implement. So his presidency might be devastating. My hope is that Kamala Harris can make it, although, honestly speaking, I'm not a great fan of hers. If Trump wins, it will be the fault of the Democrats, because for quite some time, they are not conducting a policy for the middle class and the working class. And that also resulted in the fact that many trade unionists are very skeptical about uh, Kamala Harris and uh, the Democrats in general. So I hope that Kamala Harris will win because I didn't want to, I, I don't want to have Trump again, but I also see that this country will have major problems in 2028 if Harris wins now because she won't solve the problems. Thank you once again for staying with us all the, uh, the whole time. And I would like to thank our guests, Simone Menne, Mr. Bachmann, Andreas Audrich, and uh, thanks for coming here tonight. Now you're invited to continue the conversations. Um, Downstairs, uh, we will have a drink and a pretzel ready for you.